Hi, everyone, and welcome to Murder and Merlot. We are a true crime book club podcast. I'm your host, Tara. And I'm your host, Michelle. How's it going, Michelle? Uh, It's chaotic, but exciting in my world right now. So life is good. (laughs) Excellent. And you're, you're holding together? I'm holding together. Yeah, it's really good. I, uh, my mother-in-law moved. We moved her out of the farm that we bought and my parents bought a place out in Botha and I moved them this weekend and the rentals on the farmhouse are being done and I'm just, yeah, life is crazy, but it's good. Yeah. 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 Crazy, crazy times. So yeah, we're not really posting too much on social media. Sorry, guys, we will get back into it. But right now, both of our lives, it's crazy. It's a little hectic. (laughs) It's a lot. (laughs) But the good news is that we have our first episode of Diane Downs ready to go for today. And we are super psyched about it. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm horrified and excited. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess you guys will know how I feel about it by the end of it. You definitely will. I'm mostly (laughs) just excited to blow off some steam in some of the stress by roasting Diane Downs, basically. I'm looking forward to it. Your insults are on point. (laughs) Well, we'll see. We'll see. But uh, I have some feels. (laughs) Oh, me too. Yes. Uh, Before we get to that, I just wanted to thank everybody for their responses to our last morning news regarding the discovered remains at the Kamloops Indian Residential School and the topic of residential schools in general. Uh, We are so happy to see so many people passionate about making changes and having those difficult conversations. So we just wanted to say, keep it up. Don't let the issue be forgotten again and continue the discussion. Yes, please continue the discussion. Don't let any of those kids get forgotten Mm -hmm. again yeah don't let it fade so Mm -mm. yeah thanks everybody it was really nice to hear from so many people yes so we should uh do a fluff and stuff shout out i think i think so our question was what is your go-to karaoke song Mm -hmm. fun question Mm -hmm. my favorite response came from instagram from murder and co underscore official they said night moves and I love that because I could definitely get down with some Bob Seger, which made me think, why didn't I choose old time rock and roll? Like that's a goddamn classic. It would be perfect. perfect Absolutely. Song. So much fun. Yeah. That's my new answer. So uh, Ooh, I like it. Yes. <laughs> what did you choose? Um, Alex from Small Towns, Not Small Minds said, you ought to know by Alanis Morissette. And mm-hmm. yes. Nice. I, I want to be at that karaoke bar watching her belt that out. Just oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I will be there watching, right. not singing, because I don't think I could handle that. <laughs> it's a little aggressive. Yeah. Oh, girl, get it. Yeah. I love it. You go, girl. <laughs> nice. Okay. Do you want to do the thing? <gasps> yeah, I want to do the thing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, friends, grab your glass and get cozy. Let's talk about murder. Tink, tink. <laughs> Every time we say murder, it makes me think of when we went to the registry office to (laughs) register us as a business. (laughs) The man asked us, what's your business name? And we said, murder and Merlot. And he said, murder? And we said, murder. Murder. (laughs) (laughs) And then just started laughing. And he was like, oh, dear Lord, I'm going to die today. um, I'm hoping you're opening some sort of morbid winery. I'm yes. Like, no. No, but that sounds lovely. And I hope that's, that's in idea. our cards for the future. Yeah, that's a good idea. I could retire doing that and with a right. little, like, maybe a book section too. That would be cool. Yeah. Nobody steal that idea. Just no, saying. Like that's, that's ours. ours. Copyright. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. Click. I don't know what we need to do, but <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> that's ours. Don't steal it. No kidding. Um, So just before we begin, I want to put a trigger warning on this episode. It involves the abuse, violence to, and murder of children. And we know that not everybody can listen to that. So before you fill your ear meat with nightmares, just wanted to give you the opportunity to skip or go back and listen to some morning news or whatever it is you do when skipping an episode. I'm sorry, you're being serious right now, but you said ear meat and it just... (laughs) got me I needed to to put something in there because I appreciate that 
Um, yeah. Warning, there's going to be a lot of inappropriate laughter just saying because I can't mm -hmm. control myself and I laugh at inappropriate times. So sorry. It's, yeah. it's not because I think these things are funny. It's because I'm uncomfortable. And they're terrible. Mm -hmm. Terrible. Yeah. So, are we ready? I don't know if I'm ready. Um, I'm, I'm ready. I'm looking forward to this in a okay. morbid way. Okay. So May 19th, 1983 in Willamette, Oregon. It was a quiet night at the McKenzie Willamette ER. It was 1030 PM and a car pulled into the ER parking lot. The driver laying on the horn. And when two ER nurses ran outside to see what was happening, a woman, the driver said, somebody just shot my kids. The woman stood calmly next to the car. She was pale, but she wasn't crying or hysterical. She seemed very much in control. The nurses discovered three tiny bodies in the car. They called for more help and immediately jumped into trauma mode and began assessing the situation. There was a child lying on the back passenger seat, a girl with long brown hair, a child on the floor behind the driver's seat, a sandy haired toddler boy, and a child who was face down on the front of the passenger seat covered in a dark sweater, a young girl. The ER staff quickly picked up the children and rushed them into the ER, calling for a code. Doctors and nurses appeared from all over and then began working like a well-oiled machine and assessing the children. The children had been shot in the chest at close range, with some of them having powder burns on their skin, and their injuries were extensive. Doctors were called in from other hospitals, pediatric surgeons, and cardiothoracic surgeons were called in. The last child to be brought in, the girl from the floor of the passenger seat, was pronounced dead. Her name was Cheryl. She was seven. The other two children, Christy, age eight, and Danny, age three, had critical injuries and were both rushed into surgery. Christy had a collapsed right lung and a massive hemorrhage in her left lung, and she was bleeding out. Her team of doctors and nurses worked tirelessly, and even when her heart stopped beating, they refused to give up. They got her heartbeat back and rushed her into surgery. Danny had a bullet wound to the right of his spine, and his left lung was collapsed and was at risk for severe paralysis. Amazingly, Christy survived surgery, but she wound up suffering a severe stroke that compromised her ability to speak, and Danny was paralyzed from the waist down. Whew. Already, that's a lot. <laughs> Mm -hmm. but um, well done to the ER staff, just saying. I Huge think they kudos to those ER staff, man. They're amazing. Mm -hmm. They did a great job. In the commotion, an ER receptionist had taken the mother into a separate room from the ER, so she didn't have to watch what was happening to her children. She noticed a wound on the woman's arm, and she carefully bandaged it. She had been shot in the left forearm and would later have surgery to fix the broken bones. Police took eight minutes to arrive at the hospital, and when they walked in, the woman yelled at them about how it took them long enough to show up. They questioned her about what happened. She claimed that she had been out sightseeing near Springfield, Oregon with her kids after visiting a coworker, and she was flagged down on the road by a shaggy haired man. She stopped the car and got out and the man said he needed her car keys. And the woman then feigned throwing them into the bush. This apparently enraged the stranger. And then he reached through the car window and shot her kids. And when he shot her, he stumbled backwards and she jumped back into the car and rushed to the hospital. Investigators took her statement and then they asked her and her dad to go with them to the location where the attack had happened while her children were being worked on. They drove out to Old Mohawk Road just before where it reconnected to Marcola Road. The road narrowed and there were no sh shoulders or turnoffs and the Mackenzie River ran close to the edge of the road. This was where the woman said that the shootings happened it was the most isolated place on Old Mohawk Road. No shaggy-haired stranger was found, and despite search efforts with multiple police departments, state police, and search dogs, no evidence of the stranger surfaced. Shell casings from a 22 were found near the location where the woman said the attack happened once investigators went back to the search area in the daylight. The injuries to the children were confirmed to have come from a 22 after removing shell fragments from the wounds. Meanwhile, the red Nissan Pulsar was photographed and shell casings were found, as well as blood spatter inside the car. It was sealed and taken away to be processed by the Oregon State Crime Lab. Upon returning to the hospital, the woman was given the news about her children. She was eerily calm when being told by doctors that her middle child was dead, her oldest was in critical condition and in surgery, and her youngest was stable, but likely paralyzed. Her comment when informed of Danny's injury was, quote, you mean it missed his heart? 
end quote. She then sat with a sketch artist to recreate a picture of the shaggy-haired stranger. There was something off about the woman's story, and the investigators began to question whether there was a shaggy-haired stranger at all. Did this woman shoot her children? She was very calm about the whole situation. Why would a stranger shoot this woman's children and then only shoot her in her non-dominant arm? Why, when told about her children's injury, did she not react? Why did her oldest daughter's heart rate extremely spike and her pupils dilate when she first saw her mother when she awoke after surgery? Why was there a gun in the trunk of the car? Why was there no blood splatter on the outside of the car? Investigators continued to look for and follow up on leads about the shaggy-haired stranger, but they also began looking for more information about the mother. Mm-hmm. Those are all very good questions. Very good questions. Mm-hmm. Not to mention, who goes sightseeing at 10 o'clock at night with their children? With their tiny humans. Mm-hmm. Does we'll make leave that for later in the story. We'll get into it. <laughs> Don't you worry. So the woman was Elizabeth Diane Downs, but she always went by Diane. She was born on August 7th, 1955, meaning she was 28 at the time of the shootings. And she was born in Phoenix, Arizona to Willa Dean and Wes Fredrickson. They had, I wrote two other children, but they have five kids. So, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> they had four other children as well. <laughs> Diane claims that she was molested by her father when she was 11 and that he was very strict and controlling. Diane was smart at school, but not typically one of the popular kids. Her parents forbade trendy clothing as it was against their strong Baptist beliefs and often referred to herself as the ugly duckling. Apparently her father's perversion stopped as quickly as it began and he let her enroll, enroll into charm school when she was 14. From here, she began to develop her own personality. She cut her hair into a fashionable style and started dressing more with the times and boys at her school started to take notice of her and she liked the attention she was getting. She was mm -hmm. now considered a babe. And she flirted with boys and responded to their affections with girly giggles and swaying hips. E, gross. E, also, what is charm school? <laughs> is it really like what it sounds? I, I think so. Well, I didn't really dive into that. Maybe I should. <laughs> I don't know. I just, I'm very curious. I guess if she went to charm school, it's working because she's charming all the boys. Okay. <laughs> right. Maybe you have a project to look into what charm school is. Okay, sounds good. I'll get right on it. <laughs> Report back. <laughs> um, she met her high school sweetheart, Steve Downs, at Moon Valley High. They were inseparable through high school, and her parents did not approve of the relationship. After graduation, they split up for a time. Steve joined the Navy, and Diane attended Pacific Coast Baptist Bible College. However... She was later expelled for promiscuity, so way to keep it classy, Diane. Wow. <laughs> what do you got to do to actually get expelled for that? That's concerning. Right? Like, honestly, who do you have to screw <laughs> right. to get kicked out of school for that? Yeah. Good question. <laughs> um, when Steve returned home, he proposed to Diane, and they were married on November 13th, 1973. The marriage wasn't what you would call perfect. Gone was the fun of the high school sweethearts. Steve worked a lot, and when he was home, Diane learned he was very similar to her controlling father. He beat her and ordered her around, and uh, Diane found out she was pregnant in 1974. And she loved being pregnant. Mm -hmm. It made her feel powerful and in control of the love that was growing inside of her. <sighs> mm -hmm. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> First, to... Christy Ann in October of that year. And once she had the baby, she went back to her life of making meals for her husband, working part-time at a thrift store and being a mom, which she didn't necessarily love that part. Mm -hmm. Diane decided that instead of being a mom, she would become a career woman in the Air Force. And she left when Christy was not even six months old. According to Steve, once she was gone, she would call and beg him to get her out of the Air Force. And she threatened to go AWOL. But ultimately, she was discharged after three weeks after developing terrible blisters. When she came home, Steve would send her and Christy off to her parents. And after a few days there, Steve would get a message back from Wes and Willa Dean that Diane and Christy were his problem, and they would load the two of them up on a bus and send them home. Diane found herself longing to be pregnant again so she could feel that power again. 
she went off her birth control and got pregnant. And Cheryl Lynn joined the world in January 1976. Steve fainted in the delivery room. <laughs> and when he came to, he was apparently mad that he had another daughter and not a son. Sorry for your luck, Steve, but a baby's sex is determined by the father, so you can't mm -hmm. be really mad at that. Sorry, dude. Agreed. Also, I hate when people get mad about the gender of their baby not being what they want it to be. Like, be happy that you can have children, just saying. Exactly. Yeah. You can be disappointed when you find out about the sex of your baby because you thought it was one and mm -hmm. hope for one, but right. ultimately just be happy that that baby is healthy and in your arms. Exactly. If you have a healthy, happy baby, then what more can you ask for? Exactly. Um, Cheryl was a hard baby. She was colicky. And let me tell you, <laughs> colicky babies are hard. Had yeah. one. It mm -hmm. was terrible. Mm -hmm. Love the kid to pieces. He's adorable now, but he <laughs> screamed for the first nine months of his life. Oh, boy. <laughs> He's lucky he's so darn cute, I will I, say. That's, what, I, that's why they make them cute, I swear to God. Yeah, <laughs> makes sense. <laughs> and Diane and Steve decided that after Cheryl and dealing with the constant screaming that they were done with kids. So Steve got a vasectomy. But he didn't follow the instructions to return 10 weeks post-op to ensure that he had no swimmers left. And surprise, Diane got pregnant again. Of course she did. Steve accused Diane of having an affair, but she swore up and down that she hadn't. When Steve followed up with the clinic that performed the surgery, they learned his vasectomy had failed and he was indeed still super fertile. <laughs> Why is it always these people that are so fertile? <laughs> you know, I, I don't know, but I hate those people. Yep. Hate <laughs> Agreed. Uh, quote from Diane Downs in an interview she did. I was 20 years old. I had two kids. My parents were pressuring me to potty train Christy and Cheryl was colicky. My husband was a bastard. I couldn't take one more pressure. I decided to have an abortion. I might have another Cheryl. The baby would not have been loved. End quote. Ouch. I hate this bitch. <sighs> just say. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just the beginning. Yep. <sighs> also, quick interjection. <laughs> I looked up charm school, <laughs> just so everybody knows. It is a school for young women that focuses on teaching social graces and upper class cultural rights as a preparation for entering into society. So I don't think they teach the promiscuity that she um, picked up from it. <laughs> they, they kind of failed. Yeah, I think it had the teaching Diane opposite effect because she was, I think, not so classy like she was supposed to turn out. Definitely not a classy broad. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. <laughs> Steve and Diane's marriage was rockier than ever. Neither one was happy, but both refused to give up. Diane would pack up the kids and leave Steve multiple times over 1976 and 1977. But ultimately, Steve would track her down and she would come home. For a while, she moved in with her sister and Flagstaff and went to work as a concrete truck driver. She would leave her kids all day with the babysitter and then ignore them in the evenings. She liked the job, the money was good, and again, she felt powerful doing a job that is typically done by a man, but it only lasted a month. She was raped by her boss and then ran home to Steve. The two just wound up coexisting in the same house. There was no love left in their marriage. They barely spoke to each other, and Steve always found a reason to be gone at night. Diane carried no feelings whatsoever about her abortion, no guilt, no remorse, nothing, until she came across a right-to-life booth at a fair in Arizona. And after seeing the pictures of the stage her baby would have been when she aborted, she regretted what she had done. Diane went to, on to name her unborn baby Carrie, and then she began to obsess over her. She decided that she would get pregnant again to replace Carrie. She asked a bewildered Steve to reverse his vasectomy. He refused. So she decided she would go and find a suitable donor on her own. Great. Yeah. Her and Steve were both working for the same mobile home company in Mesa, Arizona. With her new project in mind, she became a different person at work. She was vivacious and flirty. She worked hard and she was fun. At home, she was sullen and moody. She had multiple affairs with the men at work saying she was doing genetic research. You Quote, I watched the people I worked with. I picked somebody that was attractive, healthy. 
not abusive of drugs or alcohol, strong bone structure, you know, the whole bit, a good specimen. It was really clinical, end quote. <laughs> this chick. <laughs> so many feels. I know. <laughs> I know. I like want to make a hate scale mm-hmm. that we're going to call like the Raider scale because it's like right. Dennis Raider's the worst, right? right. Yeah. She's like a 9.9 on the Raider scale. Oh yeah. She's, she's right up there. Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. (laughs) Well, anyways, she chose her perfect specimen. 19 year old Russ Phillips. Diane knew her body well and chose the perfect time to seduce the poor kid. And Steve, having suspected that Diane was up to something, followed her and found his wife in bed with this kid. (laughs) That did not go over well. (laughs) <laughs> Steve started swinging. He hit Diane, he hit Russ, and a couple of Russ's roommates. After the roommates pulled a gun on him, he told Diane to get dressed and come home with him, but she refused. A week later, Diane informed Steve that she was pregnant and she was keeping the baby. December 29th, 1979, Steve and Daniel Downs was born. They called him Danny for short. Steve was there when he was born and took him willingly from the doctor when he handed the baby to dad. Steve became very fond of Danny, even though he was not biologically his. And for as much as she loved to be pregnant, Diane was not a nurturing mother. She was discharged from the hospital on Sunday and returned to work immediately on Monday, often relying on others to care for her children, for her, or neglecting them when she was around. She would get angry at her kids for not living up to her perfect love scenario that she created them to be, and she would pinch them, spank them, pull their hair, and scream at them, just because... She viewed them to have failed her. Poor Cheryl usually got the worst of her mother. She was the rambunctious one, so if something got broken, it was immediately her fault. Diane would get annoyed that her children were in her way or were loud. She would lose her temper and start screaming and getting violent with her kids. The two girls being older were constantly walking on eggshells and were confused. Sometimes their mom would play with them and buy them pets and goodies, and other times she was screaming at them for playing together. Diane felt that her kids didn't love her enough, and that's why they acted out. In truth, though, they were just being kids, playing and being loud and silly. Diane and Steve's marriage was falling apart at the seams. When she wasn't assaulting their children in some way, Steve was beating up Diane, and she was beating up on him. It was a mess all around. Luckily, Danny's biological father, Russ Phillips, loved his son so much, and he willingly would watch him anytime Diane needed or wanted to get rid of him. Well, we talk about how she loves being pregnant, but can't be a mom, but like, it doesn't even last a couple days or a couple of weeks. Like literally the day after she gave birth, she was like, see ya. See ya. I'm going to work. How is that possible? Like, I know some people go back to, to work and hardly take a maternity leave because they need to, because they need the money. But for her, it was just like, yeah, I don't want to deal with this baby. (laughs) Don't. Yeah, it's no, somebody else's it, problem. Yeah, like exactly. Once they're out of my body, right. get out of my life. Disgusting. Right. So she, you know, she found a perfect way to do that. Mm-hmm. Exactly. In April of 1980, Diane was watching the Donahue show, and they were talking about surrogacy. Diane had previously had no idea that such a process existed. And since she loved being pregnant... Once the show was over, she immediately sat down and wrote a letter to the surrogacy company in Kentucky, telling them that she wanted to become a surrogate. She omitted a lot of truth in her letter, saying her marriage was stable and her husband supported this decision and that she had three uncomplicated pregnancies. She aborted one pregnancy and and she had suffered a massive hemorrhage while pregnant with Danny. This all made her sound like a prime candidate. So they started the screening process. She filled the, the preliminary forms and then signed the surrogacy contract with the Kentucky company. She learned that she would get paid $10,000 once the surrogate baby was delivered, plus travel expenses and medical bills. So she figured once she had that $10,000, she could free herself of Steve. But in the meantime, they decided to move to a new home, and she picked up extra days at work to help pay for the new house. Then Steve's friend moved in to help with the extra expenses. Diane and Steve both were set to be evaluated by a psychiatrist in Kentucky before she could be accepted to become a surrogate. The psychiatrist had some concerns. (laughs) Surprise. Quote, 
there is considerable neurotic interplay, both in this marriage and in this woman's total adjustment to life. This would not necessarily incapacitate her as a surrogate mother, but I would like to see it full psychological report, end quote. So he requested further testing before he would sign off on her being a surrogate. And after a multitude of psychological assessments and tests, Diane was found fit to be a surrogate, even though the doctors still had some concerns about her overall mental stability. But she kept coming up on paper like the perfect candidate. So the surrogacy company kept ordering assessments with different psychiatrists until they got a pass. Two separate psychiatrists, however, found that she had a profound defect in her personality, diagnosing her with histrionic personality disorder, which as defined by the American Psychiatric Association is a personality disorder characterized by a pattern of excessive attention-seeking behaviors, usually beginning in early childhood, including inappropriate seduction and an excessive desire for approval. Sounds about right. That's very interesting. And we'll go on to see that that is absolutely correct. Diane never learned the results of her evaluations or that she had failed the first assessment. Finally, having been greenlit to be a surrogate, Diane eagerly waited for the clinic to call and get her to come out and be inseminated. She ignored Steve and the kids most of the time, shipping them off to babysitters. Danny went to his dad's often, and Russ was overjoyed to be spending time with him. Diane laid out rules for Russ if he was to babysit. He could not date any other women or drink alcohol. And she then hinted that if he did these things, she might change her mind and marry him someday, which he'd been asking her to do since Danny was born. Russ's roommate could see through Diane's words and felt bad for Russ, being led on by this crazy woman. But mostly she felt bad for the kids, especially Cheryl. Quote, Diane put everything before those kids. She would push him away. But the worst thing was... One time I caught Cheryl jumping on the bed and I told her that that was not permitted. I made her sit on a chair and think about it. Cheryl sat quietly for a while and then she looked up and asked, do you have a gun here? Of course not. Why? I want to shoot myself. My mom says I'm bad. End quote. Oh, my heart. (sighs) What child says that or thinks to say that or knows to say that? (laughs) someone who's been told to say that. Exactly. There's no other way to believe that. Mm -hmm. And when Diane couldn't find a sitter, she left the kids by themselves. They were six, five, and 15 months. Wow. That would be me Mm -hmm. leaving my two kids and a baby Mm -hmm. alone together. Yeah. That's mm -mm, not okay. Mm Mm-mm. Diane and Steve finally decided to call it quits for good. Diane found out that Steve was sleeping around and she asked for a divorce and he agreed. Diane immediately jumped into bed with someone else. She wound up sleeping with a good portion of the men she worked with at the Chandler post office. Some would be around for longer than a night. Some she convinced to move in with her to help pay her bills. But after they saw how she treated her children and sometimes theirs, they would leave. Neighbors started to notice that the children were alone a lot and would keep an eye on them and feed them if they felt they needed it. Oh, jeez. I know. Everybody else's problem but her own. Right? But thank God there was good neighbors that mm-hmm. fed those tiny humans. Absolutely. Uh, September of 1981, Diane was called to Kentucky to be a surrogate. She conceived right away, and she returned home pregnant with a child that she would eventually put into the arms of a mother who couldn't carry her own. Diane did, however, start to become attached to the baby she was carrying, which all the psychiatrists were worried about. Seriously, who was the guy who finally decided, oh, yeah, this chick will be fine. She's Mm -hmm. nuts, but she has a good uterus. Yeah. Like we can't waste those lady bits. They're too, they're too precious. I hate it. (laughs) Yeah. While pregnant, Diane continued to have multiple affairs with coworkers. Married men were like a challenge to her. And when she climbed that mountain, she then pushed them aside. Her own children were quite sick that fall. Danny had strep throat four times in three months with fevers that soared dangerously high, and Cheryl had chronic nosebleeds. Both their illnesses were likely attributed to malnutrition and being outside in the cold with no shoes or coats on. But despite all this, Diane referred to her kids and herself as the four musketeers, them against the world. She was blind to her own neglect and how her children were physically and mentally failing. The rage is building (laughs) oh i know it's like she's the worst and then it just no she's she's really the she gets worse and it just keeps going like yeah 
Oh yeah. She yeah. pisses me off. The baby was due May 10th, 1982. And Diane put her two girls on a plane by themselves and sent them to Oregon to stay with her parents for six weeks while she had the baby. Danny stayed with Steve. Her doctor was suspicious that the baby would come early, so she flew to Kentucky and was admitted to the hospital on May 7th. She was induced in shortly after midnight with the baby's true mother holding her hand. Diane delivered a healthy baby girl. She held her for a moment then passed her to the other woman. Eventually, they put the baby in a bassinet and Diane looked at her and questioned if she would regret this. But looking at her laying there, she was like, nope, not mine. <laughs> and went to recover in her room. She did ask to see the baby again after three days, and the nurse couldn't say no. Legally, she was technically Diane's child until five days after birth. Diane cuddled her and then put her back and walked away and never looked back. Diane flew home with her $10,000 in her purse, and she was already planning to be inseminated again. Wow. Well, three days is <laughs> longer than any attention she paid to her own children, so <laughs> that's something. No. Diane went back to work after three weeks after giving birth. So she actually took a break this time. Oh, wow. And she sold her house back to Steve and used the money to buy a new mobile home and a vacation. The four musketeers were back together and her divorce from Steve was final. She felt guilt-free now from the abortion she'd had after delivering the surrogate baby. She decided that she wanted to do something more with her life. She wanted to go into pre-med. She took night classes two nights a week worked full-time during the day, and continued to work her way through the men at the USPS. Eventually, she set her sights on Robert Knickerbocker. And for some reason, this man was different. He was happily married, and he became an obsession. Diane began to pursue him hard. She flirted shamelessly at work. She wore skimpy clothes and no bra, and eventually she wore him down. Their affair began in cheap motel rooms, and he was sure it would be short-lived, like all her others had been. But this went on for months. He continued to be very much in love with his wife, and he was ashamed of the affair. He tried to break it off multiple times, but she refused to let him go. Robert refused to see her if she had her kids. He felt it was wrong for him to be around them. It was an affair, and he was not playing daddy. He never had a desire to have children. And months went by. Diane kept pushing for him to divorce his wife, but he refused. And his wife was not stupid. She knew exactly what was happening between her husband and the hussy that worked with him. She marked it on her calendar. July 1982, the affair started. Diane decided that on top of wanting to be a surrogate again, night school to be a doctor, and being a parent, she wanted Robert to marry her. And as much as he insisted he didn't want to be a father or that he would not leave his wife, she pretended not to hear him. Diane did eventually drop out of school in the fall. Her schedule got to be too much, and she worried that if she continued, she would lose Robert altogether. Priorities. Mm hmm I'm just still hung up on the fact that she thought she could be a doctor after she couldn't even feed her own children. They were malnourished, and she's like, I can take care of people. That should be my job. I can do this. This is yeah. fine. This is, this is what I do. No, right. you, don't, you don't even do that on a daily basis to the humans that depend on you. Right. In September, Diane flew to Kentucky to be inseminated again, even though she was suspicious that she'd contracted an STI. She blamed Robert. This was the final straw. Robert ended it with Diane three days before she left for Kentucky, and on his birthday, September 12th, Robert confessed everything to his wife. Diane's plan backfired. She was sure that his wife would kick him out, but she didn't. Robert and his wife went to a clinic to get tested, and they tested positive for an STI, and they received treatment. Now, even though her contract stated that surrogate mothers have to be free of disease, Diane did not seek treatment or cancel her trip. She went through the insemination process again, but this time she did not conceive, which that on a whole other level just pisses me right off mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because that family that was depending on her right. and so hopeful just had their hearts broken because you're a trashy whore. Yes. Like, mm, makes me mad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if she could go back, like, I feel like the um, surrogacy could be like the one good thing she could have done with her life right. if she was a better human, but she fucks that up too. <laughs> yeah. Cause she's terrible. Mm -hmm. She's terrible. Um, after not conceiving, she went into a dark depression 
Steve picked her up from the airport and she was devastated that it wasn't Robert. Steve wanted to reconcile with her and he had left the kids with a sitter and took her back to his house so they could talk. Their talk didn't amount to much. She started hitting him and scratching his face. And before they left, she shoved something into her purse. Back at her trailer, she started talking about suicide and then went and locked herself in the bathroom. Steve tried to get her out of the bathroom and then he heard a gunfire. He broke the door open and Diane was sitting there with his 22 pistol in her hands. She turned the gun on him saying that she couldn't kill herself, but she could kill him. She hesitated and Steve grabbed the gun. He saw that she'd fired into the trailer floor. He took the gun home, which yeah, mm -hmm. maybe get her some help. I don't know. But, Probably you know. would not be a bad idea. Right. Diane. Oh, Diane. <laughs> she convinced Robert to stray again and her depression lifted magically. Mm -hmm. She went out and got a rose tattoo with his name on her shoulder. Great idea. Their affair continued, even though Robert was uncomfortable with her obsession with him. She went back to be inseminated again on October 9th, this time after being put on Clomid, a fertility drug, to increase her chances of conception. That same night, her mobile home had a fire, which investigators assumed was arson, and she collected the insurance money for. She later admitted to Robert that her and Steve had come up with the plan to start the fire so she could collect the insurance money. She failed to conceive a second time at the surrogacy clinic. Her relationship with Robert was again, and she continued to fight and be violent with Steve, and her children continued to be shoved to the side and forgotten about. Diane decided that instead of flying back and forth to Kentucky, she would just open up her own surrogacy clinic in Chandler. Mm -hmm. Seems legit, right? Reasonable, yes. <laughs> she rented a space, she took the Kentucky contract and changed it just slightly so it would suit her. She printed things on a fancy letterhead and connected with doctors and lawyers. And she booked a TV interview to discuss the clinic and that they were small, but had five surrogate mothers under contract, which in actuality, it was just her and her sister. Her stance was that parents shouldn't have to pay as much as they do to have a surrogate. So her fees would be lower than other clinics. And of course, with her being both the owner and potential mother, she would still be making bank. Mm -hmm. Needless to say, her scheme didn't go far. Robert's wife, having read an article about it in the newspaper, made a call to the Kentucky clinic, informed them of Diane's clinic, her STI, and that she was still intending on flying there to be inseminated again. Diane's contract was immediately torn up at the Kentucky clinic, and she was no longer welcome there. And her only couple that had shown interest in her company split up before any contracts were signed. Wow, <laughs> that's something else. And also, like, not that I know any, I don't have any idea what surrogacy costs, but I imagine it's so expensive to ensure things are done correctly. Yeah. That would be my guess. Yeah. Not some just, you know, shoddy clinic that just opened up and put some pieces of paper on the wall and was like, come on in. We'll knock somebody up for you. <laughs> like, right? Jesus. In February of 1983, Robert finally, finally, ended things for good with Diane. He told her he loved his wife and he would never love her the way she wanted him to. After a lot of Diane screaming and attacking him, Robert finally just walked out of the door. Diane chased him in her car and tried to cut him off. Calmly, Robert just climbed over the hood and continued down the street. He called his wife from a 7-Eleven phone booth and she came and picked him up. Diane then went and spent the night pounding on Robert's door and calling his house. In the morning, she was back. She delivered mail to his house, and this time Robert's wife, Charlene, opened the door. Quote, she began to tell me what I should do about my marriage, my relationship with Robert, everything, and I just lost my cool. She'd heard him so much. I don't usually swear, but I told her to fuck off and slammed the door in her face. End quote. Aw. <laughs> I'm like, okay, and this woman is very, very forgiving. Yes, right? absolutely. That's what I was going like, to say. <laughs> you just told off your husband's mistress. Yes. And because she hurt him. Yeah, exactly. And that was like huge for her to be like, fuck off and slam the door. She was like, that was, that was a big deal. But it's like other people would like actually lose their shit <laughs> and do some damage. 
Yeah. No, it wouldn't have gone well. <laughs> no, she's a very... Most people would not have gone well. Yeah. She seems to be very civilized. <laughs> right? Kudos to you, Charlene. Mm-hmm. Um, with their relationship finally ended, Robert left for Texas for a while to create more distance between himself and Diane. Well, you can imagine how Diane took that. She immediately requested a transfer to a post office in the Eugene, Oregon area, so she could be close to her parents. Her dad, being a ma- mail carrier there, already told her that getting a job would be not an issue, and her employers were quickly to greenlit this request. They were happy to be washing their hands of the woman who dressed inappropriately, carried on multiple affairs, threw temper tantrums worse than any toddler, and would also refuse to deliver Playboy and Penthouse magazines. Bye, Felicia. (laughs) What a hypocrite. (laughs) Right? That's funny. She won't deliver porn, but she'll literally like screw everybody in the post office. Mm -hmm. And specifically seek out married men. (laughs) Yeah. She's a good person. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Robert is not very good at keeping his junk in his pants, it turns out. (laughs) He returned from his Texas vacation, and the two weeks before Diane was set to move to Oregon, he, feeling guilty for forcing her to move states, hopped right back into bed with Diane. And in some post-orgasm haze, he asked Diane to stay with him in an apartment until she left. No. (laughs) God damn it. So Diane is thinking... He loves me. So really, nothing has changed. It's Robert still love. loved his wife Ugh. and still did not want to be a father. But after a few drinks one night, Dan convinced Robert to get a matching rose tattoo. God damn it. This was it. End game. Diane believed she was going to get her happily ever after with Robert. She believed that he was going to transfer to Oregon and they would just start over there. But... Robert had already made up his mind that he wasn't going anywhere. He was going to repair the damage he had done with his wife and live a peaceful existence without Diane around. Quote from Robert. Once the sound of her talking stopped, once my head cleared, I could think again. I didn't want to be with Diane. I wanted to be with Charlene. End quote. Literally sounds like a drug addict that like relapses and then realizes like, (laughs) this is toxic. I need to get out. But then they find their way back. Right. I love that he was like, once the sound of her talking stopped, I mm-hmm. like, oh, I can live my life. Yeah. <laughs> but she like, just never stops talking. So. What is this? Freedom? My own thoughts? What? what is happening? I don't, I don't want to be with this crazy woman. <laughs> huh. Yeah. Weird. Crazy. Weird. Once in Oregon, Diane kept sending Robert letters and romantic cards and he started refusing her mail. And he finally called her and told her they were done. He would not be joining her in Oregon and that he was staying with his wife and it would never happen with them again. So <laughs> jumping back to the night of the shooting, Diane was quiet. Oh, sorry. Diane was quite compliant with the investigators. Like I said before, she even went out to the spot where the shooting happened with the officers. The children were immediately placed under guard. Since at that moment, there was no real reason to believe that the shooter wouldn't try to come back and finish the job they had started. And they had someone with them at all times. Steve Downs arrived in shock to see his children in such horrific states. He was questioned by the police about his whereabouts, his relationship with Diane, his children, and if he or Diane owned guns. Diane gave permission for her house to be searched in an effort to find a reason that someone would want to hurt her children. At the house, they found and collected as evidence a pile of diaries written by Diane, as well as finding in her closet a 22 Glenfield rifle. And detectives and district attorney Hughie all felt that something was very off with Diane's story. Detective Paul Alton is quoted saying, I don't buy it. She goes out to Sunderman to see Heather Plored. She decides to go sightseeing and heads towards Marcola. Suddenly she decides she'll veer off on the old Mohawk Road. Say we buy the story that she's sightseeing. Even if it's almost pitch dark, she's sightseeing. How do we explain that the shooter knew she was going to be there? If he's following her in his own car, he could trail her onto Old Mohawk, but she tells us that the stranger is in front of her, standing in the road, waving her down. How does he get there? End quote. And there were many more questions. If the shooter had indeed wanted the car, why not shoot the adult first? What did the shooter have to gain by shooting three innocent children? 
Forensic investigators found some curious findings from the car when they processed it. Forensic scientist James Pex from the Oregon State Police Department presented his report to the DA and his team. He found a couple of 22 caliber U-shell copper casings ejected after firing. No bullet had penetrated the body of the car, indicating that all bullets, between the children they suffered, five bullet wounds, had hit their live marks. Blood smeared the side of the door of the front seat where Cheryl had tumbled after being shot, and pools of blood stained the rear seat where Danny and Christy had been hit. But Pex noted, quote, no blood at all on the driver's side, no smears on the steering wheel. End quote. If a bullet had hit Diane as she was getting into her car, as she said, it would have been reflex for her to grab that wound with her idle hand. There would have been blood on that hand, then, as she tried to steer the car from the scene, blood on the steering wheel. Also, he explained, when a bullet is fired, the barrel discharges a small amount of smokeless gunpowder frontwards towards the target. Such powder particles were detected in three angles of the car. On the right panel, and in a sweep along the back seat. There were no particles, however, on the driver's panel. So what does this all mean? Pex explained that it could very well mean that whoever did the shooting had been seated in the driver's seat, and that Diane Downs shot herself just before she reached the hospital. Brain <sighs> explosion. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That makes a lot more sense than the original scenario. Yeah. There was no murder weapon found at the scene, but from the injuries and shell casings found, it was determined that the gun they were looking for was a 22 Ruger handgun. Do you remember the kind of gun that mm -hmm. she uh, tried to shoot Steve with? Yeah. A 22 Ruger handgun. Coincidence? I think not. I think not. <laughs> uh, and yeah, Diane had one of those, and it was even seen in her possession on the, her last day in Arizona by Robert. He saw it in her trunk. But Diane denied to police that she ever owned one. 22 shell casings were found by the road where the shootings happened, and matching 22 shell casings were found in Diane's car. Ballistics also collected cartridges that were found in the 22 rifle that was found in her closet. A big breakthrough happened when 22 rounds fit both weapons. The 22 rifle was not the death weapon, but the cartridges inside had once been in the clip of the missing Ruger. The tool marks showed that the cartridges had been mechanically manipulated through the receiver of the same weapon, not fired, but loaded and unloaded. This revelation from ballistics ruled out the possibility of a random shooting. But the problem with just ballistics evidence is that it's hard to convince a jury to convict on just some microscopic markings on a shell casing. They needed more evidence. Either they needed to find the murder weapon or find ways of connecting Diane to the crime. And that whole concept of the shell casings being in the in the rifle fitting into the handgun i was like mm -hmm. des was falling asleep beside me as i was reading this and i was like wake up you know about guns and he's like what 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 <laughs> and so i'm like how would this happen like explain mm -hmm. this to me and he's like mumble something and he's like drifting back off to sleep giving me half answers and i was like no nah, i'll fucking ask tara later <laughs> but i think i figured it out okay because they did explain it further in the book but i was like you're not helping me right now. Yes. Yeah, definitely. The shell casings from the rifle fit yeah. in the Ruger handgun and she would right. load and unload the gun with, with the shell casing. They want right. the same in the rifle. So. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anyways, <laughs> the investigation went along, following up on leads on the shaggy haired stranger, looking into possible ex-lovers to see if they could have been responsible, and of course, continuing to look into Diane herself. Steve and Robert were interviewed extensively, but both were cleared of being suspects. They both had alibis in Arizona the night of the shooting. But through their interviews and interviews with neighbors and coworkers, investigators were able to start to see a picture of what Diane Downs was about. Investigators then tried their hardest to connect the 22 handgun that was in Diane's possession to the 22 handgun that had shot her children. They went so far as to try to track down Steve's old truck that he'd had since sold, and it had been sold like twice, I think, because it may still have shell casings in it from him target shooting out of his truck. Mm -hmm. They tracked the truck all the way to Mexico, and they went to Mexico, and then they ran into dead ends. Uh, <laughs> and they also crawled under Diane's trailer, where she'd fired the twenty two handgun into the floor. They did find the shell fragment, but it was so deteriorated that it turned out to be useless. And when reading this part of the book, I couldn't help but thinking, what an extensive waste of resources. <laughs> Very true. Very true. Like, you're going to go to Mexico? Right. 
to find a truck that may or may not have a shell casing in it that might match that gun. Mm -hmm. Come on, guys. Yeah. Really reaching. Mm -hmm. Reaching. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) While investigators are working hard to solve the puzzle of the shooting, Diane's kids were put in protective custody. As they recovered to a point where they could leave the hospital, they were placed in foster care. Christy had started seeing a psychologist as well as a physical therapist, and she was beginning to make progress in her speech. She currently could not remember anything about the night of the shooting, and her team of medical professionals believed that those memories were in there, just suppressed. Danny would also begin to see the psychologist as well. Diane was not permitted to know where her children were or to see them. She was aware that she was being pursued as a suspect, and so she did what she did best. She started talking. Diane would meet often with the media and play the victim and blame the Oregon PD for not doing their job in tracking down the shaggy haired man. She would go to the detectives to tell them new details that she just remembered or to just rehash things that she'd already said. She was a fixture in the media and if things started to die down, she would strike up a press conference or interview to keep the focus on her. Detectives were getting frustrated. They felt that they had enough evidence to arrest her, but District Attorney Fred Hughey was not willing to take the risk with circumstantial evidence. He needed solid evidence for a conviction. Otherwise, if she got off and hard evidence came up, she could not be tried again because of double jeopardy laws. He needed this evidence to stick, so he kept pushing for detectives to keep digging. Fred Hughey's biggest hope for the investigation was Christy Downs. If she could remember what happened on the night of the shooting, and articulated in court, they would have a solid conviction. Hughie poured over Diane's journals in hopes of finding some sort of clue. What he read was all about Diane's obsession for her lover, Robert Knickerbocker. They talked about how she longed for him and how their lives had played out in Arizona, but there was a switch in her tone in her entries. She felt he had abandoned her and hinted at how it was her children's fault because he didn't want to be a dad. Could this be a motive? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Problems were arising, though. The levy to fund the sheriff's and district attorney's office failed, and funds were taken away that were needed. A county bigger than either Rhode Island or Delaware was now virtually without police patrols. And this also meant that the detectives were out of money for this investigation and were no longer permitted to continue to dig on the country's dime. So the investigative team was cut down to one person, and lots of the work was done on his own time. Fred Hughey had become very protective over the kids, having sat with them for hours of the day when they were still in the hospital. He really wanted a conviction that would stick for the kids' sake. They were both doing well with their foster family. Christy's speech was improving, and she began to open up with her foster parents, and she began to trust them. And she stopped checking to see if they were still there in the middle of the night, which breaks my heart. Mm -hmm. And Danny, although paralyzed, he was happy and thriving in this new environment. Christy was making such good progress with her psychologist that she was at a point with him where she felt safe enough to start opening up and sharing secrets that were locked deep in the dark places of her brain. Fred Hughey was so encouraged by Christy's progress that he filed an affidavit with the juvenile court. It read, quote, I talked with Dr. Carl V. Peterson on Tuesday, September 27th, 1983, and Wednesday, September 28th, 1983. Dr. Peterson informed me that it is his professional opinion that Christy saw the person that shot her on May 19th, 1983, and that Christy will be able to describe that person and events surrounding the shooting in the future. Dr. Peterson informed me that he believes Christy should be able to do this within a period of four to six months. Dr. Peterson is not in a position to know whether Christy's recollection will corroborate or contradict Elizabeth Diane Downs's recollection of the event, end quote. And then Hughie went on to file a continuance of the matter, quote, due to its extreme gravity and and importance to all the parties, I believe that in fairness to all parties, the case should not be litigated while there remains a reasonable probability that Christy Downs may be able to provide crucial eyewitness testimony as to the identity of her assailant. In a case of this magnitude, we should only proceed with the best evidence that can be reasonably obtained, end quote. The delay was granted. Mm -hmm. And that, friends, is where I'm going to stop for today. Excellent. Good little, good little cliffhanger for you. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So my references for today were Small Sacrifices by Anne Rule, Murderpedia, and Wikipedia. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thoughts? Thoughts. Um, lots of thoughts and feelings. Um, I didn't bring out all my 
my name calling just yet because mm-hmm. that will happen when we get into when Diane starts digging her own grave and um, we really find out about her like interviews and the things that she says. Um, so yeah. uh, that's when I'll really <laughs> mm-hmm. dig into her because she says some shit. Um, I want to say that I hope nobody thinks that we're slut shaming in any way. I don't have any problem with promiscuous women like you go girls. No, like- I have a problem with Diane Downs purposely seeking out married men just for her own personal gain, like mm-hmm. getting pregnant for her own benefit only for how she feels while she's pregnant and not taking care of her children I mean, and it not kind of, like the feelings of the yes. man, right? Like Exactly. Having no consideration about anybody else's feelings and then as well lying about all of her past history in order to become a surrogate and all that kind of stuff. So just want to put it out right. there. No hate to women that are promiscuous. That's fine. Right, I'm I'm what cool am? with that. You go girl. I just hate Diane Downs. <laughs> right. Because it's yes. all for the wrong reasons. It's for it's, the wrong reasons. It's only for personal gain and not for good reasons. Yeah. No, no. And she is a terrible human being. Like you can tell that because she got herself an STI and then still went mm-hmm. to get inseminated and is like, oh, my bad. Yep. And sorry. then has to the... sorry. Just like. Right. Not only the audacity to lie about all of that, but then to try to start your own fertility clinic. What? <laughs> right. And so insane. while still having a contract in Kentucky, mm-hmm. which could mean that if she got inseminated in Arizona and inseminated in Kentucky, right. she wouldn't potentially know whose baby she was carrying. Exactly. So there's right? a family like, out there that's going to get a really, person. really screwed over. Yeah. Right. And man, infertility is no joke. It, mm-hmm. I have friends that have struggled yep. for years and, mm-hmm. you know, have had difficulty. I myself have had difficulties and you know what? Fuck you, Diane Downs. Yeah. Just saying it. And <laughs> that's what makes me hate her so much. Well, that aspect, obviously, of course, what mm-hmm. she did to her own kids is horrible and unforgivable, but, but that just adds another layer to it. And she says, Like there's certain quotes that I'm sure you'll bring up in the next episode. If you don't, I will, but it's about that general idea and oh man is Mm -hmm. so wrong. So yeah. I hate her so much. I, yeah. So, so much. So much, but great job. Yeah. Um, And in the next episode, we will cover Diane's arrest because yeah, she does get arrested. Spoiler alert. Spoiler. Um, not so spoiler. All of this build up for her not to get arrested just wouldn't be worth it. Right. So, um, her trial, her sentencing. And then I'm going to end off with where her children wind up because mm-hmm. I think that's good. Um, mm-hmm. And it's a really happy story and it makes good. Me- it makes my heart happy. Yeah. Um, something, something to look forward to. That's not so yeah. depressing. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, yeah. So are you ready for some fluff and stuff? I sure am. After any story that deals with tiny humans, we could all use some fluff and stuff. Yeah. Um, so my question today is, if you were reincarnated as an animal, what would you come back as and why? <laughs> That's a great question. Um, a cockroach so I could bug the shit out of people and not <laughs> and be indestructible. <laughs> you're, gonna, no. you're the apocalypse. Yeah. No. Um, <laughs> actually, that sounds pretty get cool. stepped on. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But survive an apocalypse? That sounds pretty cool. Um, actually, no. My, <laughs> my legit answer, I think, would be an otter, which, like, I just love otters uh, so much now, like, after we're, otters. like, the little merlotters, but um, I think yeah. they're just, like, so freaking cute, and they just float around, and they have their, like, little pockets in their skin where they keep their favorite rocks in their food, and I just I think that sounds so lovely. And, and they hold hands, so I they know. don't float away from each other while they're exactly. sleeping, and I just, oh, I love them. I know. <laughs> so I would be an otter. Yes. Um, yeah. I think... I didn't even really put much thought into this because I was just like, oh, I probably have an answer in my head. Yeah, um, something will Otter is definitely on my list. Nice. Yeah, otter is definitely on my list. But probably, let's be honest, I would be a chubby orange house cat. Oh, the best. 
and specifically well, well, orange chubby orange house cat they yeah. are the best truly <laughs> because you know they sit in the window they mm -hmm. just soak up the sun i know they nap yep. all day yep like they get up they eat some food mm -hmm. they get some love if they want it yes and on then they go back they get love on their own terms which right. is what i need I only right. want love on my own terms. <laughs> right. And then they go back and they like do a little bird watching, mm -hmm. you know, make cute chirping sounds at the window and then, you know, go back to their nap. Yep. Yeah. That's a life I could live. Take a hit of catnip every now and then. Like, it sounds <laughs> not bad. Honestly, it your sounds good. meals are provided for you. Somebody <laughs> cleans your bathroom. Right. Like, you have a personal slave. Bad. Like, <laughs> right? uh, I love chubby orange house cats just right? pretty much all cats well but specifically orange house cats. they are they hold a special place in our hearts <laughs> they do they definitely yeah. do Aww. yeah <laughs> excellent so make sure to answer our question as well and let us know what you think about the episode you can email us at murder merlot at gmail.com Find us on Instagram at Murder Merlot Podcast, Facebook at Murder Merlot Podcast, and Twitter at Murder Merlot One. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, Podbean, Spotify, and pretty much anywhere else you can find podcasts. We would love if you subscribed, and if you don't, you're dead to me. Yeah, and are you going to tell them what our next book is? Well, you know, I changed my mind. <laughs> what? You didn't tell me that you changed your mind. Yeah, because I haven't made an official decision yet of what I'm changing my mind to. Oh, okay. okay. I just know that the book that I was going to do, it just didn't really fit because it's like going to be dead summer and it oh. happens in the dead of winter. And I'm like, True. I just feel like, I don't know what it is, but I feel like the timing has to be right with the story. Totally. And when totally. we tell the story, which is why this, this story that you're doing is so perfect because it like majority of the things that happen are happening like in May and June and everything. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, this is, I don't know. It just feels very suiting. So I just feel like I can't do a winter cold ass story in the middle of summer. You know what? Maybe doing a winter cold ass story in the middle of summer might be nice and might, might feel cooler might. while we're recording and not it's like, I feel like I am right now. Yeah, well, <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. But honestly, I hate winter so much that I'm like, bring it, bring on all the heat. I don't care. I'll fry to death. <laughs> right. Yeah. So um, I will, I'll keep you in the loop <laughs> Okay. <laughs> when okay. I make a decision. Yeah. Which yeah. needs to happen right away. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> all right. We can always fill with morning news. People like them. Yeah. They're great. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, now that we're in suspense, thanks, Tara. Mm -hmm. I guess remember to drink wine <laughs> because it's not good to keep things balled up. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>